put it on YouTube. I'm just looking at his CV, um, and he's got an impressive number of exhibitions. Um, most recently, he's exhibited in Enough is Definitely Enough. Contemporary artists respond to Las Men uh, Meninas in OA Gallery in Salford in 2020. I hope I said it correctly. And then uh, Fully Awake, a uh, freelance foundation in London. Also in Berlin uh, at Inner Landscapes and Intersection uh, in Huddersfield in 2019. He was long listed for the Contemporary British Painting Prize back in 2019. And he's also presented papers um, at the Royal West of England Academy in Bristol um, and also in uh, Royal Academy of Arts in London. Uh, and uh, and at this point, I'm just going to leave it uh, to Brandon. Um, I'll pass it on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelazim. Uh, I'll just share my screen. And hoping everybody, sorry, everybody can see this stream. Okay, welcome to MacFest 2024. MacFest is an international festival based here in the northwest of England, devoted to Islamic culture that aims to bring Muslim and non-Muslim people together to share the breadth and richness of Islamic artistic practice. And MacFest is supported by the University of Salford. As Karazina said, my name is uh, Brendan Fletcher. I'm your host for today. I'm a senior lecturer and programme leader in fine art at the University of Salford. And today's event consists of a Islamic calligraphy demonstration, a practical workshop led by Samir Malik, a London-based artist and calligrapher. And the event is due to last around 90 minutes. Now, just a moment ago, um, uh, Samir asked me if I could ask you all at home who want to participate in this presentation, if you can find two pencils and strap them together with sellotape or with an elastic band. If you can find, put your hand with, to those things, then you'll be able to participate in this and be able to show you some techniques. Okay. Um, today's event uh, is not just the um, presentation by Samir. Samir. We also are further supported by uh, artist and lecturer Paul Vivian, who is the Director of Art and Design at the University of Salford. But I'd like to start today by offering a few observations and introducing the three of us uh, before I hand over the stage to Samir, and I promise not to keep you too long. Okay. Calligraphy is an art form that explores writing and the alphabet. An Islamic calligraphy examines Arabic writing and is closely linked to the Quran. It's a means of communicating the ineffable, um, a means of expressing what cannot be communicated by words alone. And calligraphy, in its union of form and shape, rearticulates the words with additional or renewed meaning and significance. Uh, it's an art form that is at once abstract in character and at once readily and easily intelligible. At least it is for those who can read it. And I need to confess to you all now, I cannot read the text. Um, I have no Arabic and I'm left to dwell on the color, the tone, the form and the aesthetic character. And then if I want to dive into that work, I need to undertake further research to unlock the mysteries of the text and the context and the significance of the work. And what I've got to say is it more than rewards the effort required. And in these last two examples by Samir, you've got some fabulous uh, uh, work. In preparation for today's event, uh, Samir and Paul and I have met a couple of times to discuss art and drawing and painting and calligraphy and abstraction, and indeed our own personal journeys into becoming practicing artists. 
And we discovered a great deal about each other. And we were both surprised and indeed comforted, I think, to find that many of our ideas and indeed our experiences aligned with one another. Samir has been on a surprising journey um, in becoming or in, in achieving his goal of becoming a practicing artist. And indeed, I'll leave it to him to tell you his story because he's a wonderful raconteur. Um, but it has involved overcoming parental and societal pressures, um, a career in medical practice, a damascene moment of epiphany in Syria, and the development of a body of work which is both rich and dynamic, and which is, and I use a word which is seldom used in art circles and art criticism these days, I think it's beautiful. Um, and it's not only beautiful, it is critically engaged and it's wonderful stuff. Um, we're also here with Paul Vivian, a um, colleague from the University of Salford. Paul Vivian studied painting at Chelsea School of Art before moving on to Norwich School of Art to complete his MA. And his practice over many years has involved painting, sculpture, installation, and more recently, film and video works. And his latest work, pictured here on the right, uh, involves Paul journeying into the sites of Paleolithic standing stones across the UK and making field recordings using contact microphones of the sounds emanating from the stones themselves. It's an absolutely intriguing and highly conceptualized practice, um, well worth taking further look. My own practice is as an abstract painter. Uh, I studied first in Hull and then for an MA in Manchester, and I make small scale abstract paintings that attempt to explore the ambiguity of images. I'm fascinated by the way that forms and signifiers can suggest and embed ideas into their visual vocabulary. Now, in conversation in recent weeks, uh, the three of us have found so many points of reference and intersection in our approaches to art, and indeed that journey of becoming an artist. And I hope over the course of the next uh, 90 minutes or so, we'll be able to tease out some of these correspondences. Okay. But I'm going to start today by uh, asking Samir to introduce himself and tell us a little bit about his journey of becoming an artist and to talk us through a workshop demonstration on the art of Islamic calligraphy. Uh, once Samir has finished around three o'clock, I'm gonna pull in Paul for a little discussion and dis uh, a few observations about uh, that presentation, and then we'll invite questions from the audience here today. If you do have a question during Samir's presentation, you can please, you can put that into the chat. If we can pass that on to um, Samir immediately without disrupting him, then we'll do so. If not, we'll leave that. We'll gather those together and raise them at the end. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand over, I'm going to close this share and hand over you to Samir Malik. Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I feel very privileged to do what I do. And what I love more than doing what I do is sharing it with others and inspiring them. Okay, who am I? Um, I, ever since I was a child, I wanted to be an artist. I wanted, I, I used to stink the house up with paints and, and just, you know, just like always doodle and always like, you know, just, had you know loved it but my father had other other ideas so when i was about seven my father threw away all my art gear and told me that i'll be a doctor a lawyer an accountant or engineer like a you know a, a, a nice job rather than just being an artist and so um i ended up studying medicine i practiced medicine i moved to germany where i practiced it and while i was in germany living in munich i I painted and I explored and I met loads of other artists in Germany at the time in Munich. I was, I looked very exotic. Um, most people with my skin color and accent weren't working in big jobs. And, uh, so every, you know, all the Brazilians thought I was Brazilian or the Italians thought I was Italian. And so I met loads of the different communities that come from all over the world and through them got in contact with loads of the artists from those communities and just explored, played, 
last 10 years in Germany, I thought, okay, I'll, I've done my bit. My father should be happy. And I gave it all away and I moved to Damascus to go and find myself. Um, and while I was there, my sister, who was living there at the time, um, she was studying Arabic, said, you know, mentioned there was a course for calligraphy at the university. And um, from my first lesson, I thought, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I just loved it. It was just like, I did it really badly. Um, but it was such a, it brought out so much joy and so much stillness in my heart that I thought this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I've been doing it ever since. That was uh, over two decades ago. And so after a year at university in Damascus, I came back to Europe and I carried on exploring and playing and doing other jobs on the side to pay the rent and put food on the table. But I just loved the calligraphy and got to the point where I started sharing and people started noticing. And so uh, my whole skills that developed through practice, through doing it badly and through exploring and through, through trying to be authentic in my self-expression. I mixed up lots of di different dis disciplines. I started playing with form. And my first exhibition I had was at, uh, in London. And it was, um, lots of Arabs came and they, they, they said to me, Yanni, it, it's very nice. It's very beautiful but it's all wrong. And I took that as a compliment because they could recognize it. They could read it. They, they appreciated that it's beautiful, even if it contradicted their norms. So for me, that was like a little badge of approval. When I, when I finished in Damascus, uh, my teacher asked me, what do I do for the rest of your life? And I said, I want to change calligraphy in the world forever. I want to you know, make it accessible, make it easy, make it you know, beautiful and different. And uh, I realized with my first exhibition, I'd taken a big step in that direction. So um, since then, I've, I've been working, developing my style. They've actually named it officially Maliki Style after me. And I just get to explore and play. I worked with embassies all over the world. I worked with royalty, had the privilege of the Queen commissioning works for mine and uh, have it hanging from Mecca to Jerusalem to, to Texas to Sydney, Australia, and I just love it. I just, you know, and I'm, I'm just, uh, um, people get upset with me very often because after a whole long day's work, I, I, I'm very relaxed and very happy and, you know, and uh, they're like, you should, you should be tired after working, but, you know, I love what I do and because I do it daily, it just doesn't feel like work and uh, I, but I, uh, part of my commitment to teaching is getting others to actually find what they love doing to share with the world and uh yeah if everyone's doing what they love doing you know the world would be a great place so i'm going to share some brendan gratefully shared you know some works of mine you got to see it i'm going to switch the camera over to show you a little presentation this is my desk at my studio so there we are Okay, so that's what one Brendan showed. It's, uh, well, it says love, but I deconstructed it, took all the words apart in Arabic and added geometry and colors and forms. A lot of my work involves geometry I've done with pencil, paper, and inks, with photography. I've, I'm, a, I'm an avid photographer, and um, I love shape, form, colors, so I mix them all together using Photoshop. Um, that's classically my work, ink, you can see the Maliki style there with the colors, with the forms, we mix together. That says God, love of God, love. Lots of my work is an exploration of what it means to be human. What does God mean? What does love mean? What, is, what are we are? Who are we in this whole grand scheme of things? So um, you can see there, lots of work with inks, lots of work with paint. Show you some more. I've done work in mosques, I've done work in synagogues, I've done work in churches. Lots of digital work I've started doing. The digital involves first doing it on pen and paper uh, with ink and then scanning it and playing with it and exploring. And that's his light truth, for example. Design work, I've done work for Liverpool. Uh, Welcome to Liverpool, that reads. That was for the Yemeni community in Liverpool a few years ago. Uh, lots of digital work. So here we come to the tools. 
Now, uh, as Brendan Brickley mentioned, uh, if you get two pens together, I'm going to just uh, clench my phone, steady, excuse me. I'm just drop. If you get two pens together and align them and just get some tape or a band or something, wrap it around so they're aligned, I'm going to teach you how to get started with Arabic calligraphy in a way that uh, my, my teacher taught me. So when I was in Damascus, my teacher, the first lesson, she said, if there's one thing, if you do it really, really well, you can do anything in Arabic calligraphy. Now, um, classically, we use bamboo reed pens. We notice that the angle is there. So the thing that my teacher taught me is to do that, the dot, nukta it's called in Arabic. But um, if you can do a dot really, really well, I'm going to show it with the ink first, and I'm going to show it with pencils. You put it at an angle, and you draw it into daisy, and you make a, it's like a diamond shape. So doing that will allow you to do anything that you need to do in Arabic calligraphy. My first homework when I was in Damascus in university was to do 3,000 dots, 3,000 alif, which is the first letter of the alphabet, and 3,000 ba, which is the second letter of the alphabet. I've got these sheets you can print out. If, I'll show you my email at the end. If you, if you want a copy of these sheets to print out, then I will happily email them to you. That's an alif, which is a straight line and a bar, which is like that. So I'm going to show you, using the pencils, doing dots. If you can't see this, please speak up. So that's doing the dots in Arabic. So the point of doing 3,000 of these, I, I, I spoke to my, my teacher when I came back from my homework, you know, and I said that my arm almost fell off, you know, 3,000 of these is just like, was crazy. So she looked over my sheet that was filled with dots. And out of 3,000, she picked about 20 that were perfect. So I, I, I got a little bit upset because I just thought 20 out of 3,000 isn't a very good batting average. Um, and she said, no, no, you misunderstand. Those, those 20 that I've picked out are worthy of a master calligrapher who is top of his game and is one of the best in the world. And, you know, so you have it in you to become, you know, a great calligrapher who's, you know, world class, which made me really happy. So um, if, you, if you're working with the pencils, just do a dot, make a mark like that, and then make the diamonds. So the first letter of the Arabic alphabet, what I forgot to mention, that doing the dots so many times allows you to keep this angle. It's a 45 degree angle. Every letter apart from two of them in the Arabic alphabet will have that angle with all the lines. And by doing 3,000 dots, it trains your hand to always keep that angle, that in the classical pens, the angle is there, so that angle. So, to do the alif, which is the first letter, which is a straight line, you put the pen down, which if you're going to do a, a dot, but instead of doing, so going that way, you, with your elbow, you go straight down. And you got an alif. So, it takes a bit of practice. And at the end, I lift it up. So it makes this nice, sharp point at the bottom. So, that's an alif. Or four of them, rather. The bar is... When you put the pen down as if you're going to do a dot, and you actually do a dot and extend it a little bit, so it's a little bit longer, and from that same angle, keeping the same angle, you go across and up, and you've got the bar. So that's... So I'll happily send all these out. I'll send the sheets out to print out.
that's a bat. So uh, I, I'm not sure if any, many of you know the Arabic alphabet. If you don't, you see, I, I, I prepared. Shows you the angles. And it shows you also, that's like an A, B, T, the, J, H, Z. We've got the Z, the R, the D, the S, the Sh. So, um, for example, um, if I'm going to do Brendan, and you can you can put your names down to, to for me to do as well. I'll show you how Brendan will be done. So Brendan will be the B, the R, the N. There's the N. There we are down there. N, D, and N. So I'll, I'll write down. I'll write Brendan's name. So we start with the B. And the the letters when they're joined to other letters often do not have um, uh, do not have the complete form. But not all letters will, will be joined. And I'll send that out happily as well as a sheet. So that's got the BR, then the N, which is the dot there, the T, and the N. So that says Brendan. And um, this is how we join the letters. So um, what I'm going to do is just run through the letters. I'm going to actually use the um, the pen. I've got a smaller pen here. They come in different sizes. I'm going to show you the letters. So A, like I showed you earlier, that's A. B. Now, I don't know if you heard that sound. I just think, oh, the pen split. You got one. The first time in Damascus, I was invited to visit professional calligraphers. I was so excited. And um, after I came away, I was very, very upset. Because what I realized, I, this is the sound you hear in in, in factories that produce calligraphies. Sounds like a, sh a creaking ship. What they actually do, the reason I was upset, is because they'll, they'll do a B, and then it, part of the ink will go off, so then they'll get some more ink, and they'll color it in. And I went there looking for massive revelations about being an amazing artist and calligrapher, and I, when I got there, I realized that I've been coloring in since I was four years old. So actually, I'm fully qualified to be a, a calligrapher of, of the classical styles. That's the B. So B also has a dot. Then we'll have the, the T. The Arabic alphabet deviates slightly from uh, the English, English or European scripts. The T is the same form with two dots above. Then you have the ha and the j, j. Many, many, uh, I'm just going to take the sheet away so I get the line underneath. Many Arabic uh, letters share form. So we've got the ha, which is. And with, with the ha, you also have the j. To make it into the J, put the dot there, or the ha, ah, sorry, ha, ah, uh, my, my throat's a bit, but it's that KH sound, you put the dot above. So, the ha, the, or the J, or the ha, when they're the first letter in the alphabet, they join on like that with the other next letter. When they're in the middle, they join like that. And when, when they're at the end, they're like that. So the, the letters will come through like that, like that, like that. Okay. If that's not clear or if somebody wants me to repeat that, then please don't hesitate to, to send a message. Next letter we have is the dal or da. And that's one dot, two dots, 
keeping the same angle. So you can see, let me fill that in there. That angle, that angle, that angle is always the same because in Arabic, we try and, you know, keep the pen always at, at the, you know, the same angle, except for two letters, like I mentioned. The first of these letters is the ra, which is like the da, two dots, and then it's got a pointy bit. So what we do, we do that, and then we take the tip of the pen, and we make that angle. Because to actually get that angle, we have to turn the pen around. We don't want to turn the pen around. We want to keep that flow. So that's the ra. And we saw that in Brendan's name, the second letter was the was the ra. Next, we have the S or sh, s or sh. You do a dot. Oops, sorry. Go across. And with with Arabic calligraphy, you always re-ink your pens. You do another dot, and you go across. And you do another dot. And come round. So that angle, that angle, that angle, that angle. All the same. That's the S. So, uh, as you can probably gather, showing you this, Arabic calligraphy is more to do with technical drawing than it is actually to do with... Uh, with calligraphy itself, it forms calligraphic script, which is beautiful to behold and uh, communicates clearly, easy to read. But to actually write it professionally, you have to um, be uh, you know, more of a technical architect of, of, of ink on paper rather than, um, than uh, you know, in the, uh, the artistic side. The artistic flair helps, and that's what I brought into my work more. So uh, let me show you the next letter. It's, it's, it's called Saad. So not, it's not an S, it's more a Sa. So it's, you start off as if you're going to do a dot. You go up. Then you do two dots. Go across. And then... That's a sad. Now this is I'm, I'm moving really really fast, so I really appreciate you know that this might be uh, quite overwhelming. But just go with the flow. Go with the flow. Watch me. There will be a video re recording of this available afterwards, so you can check. So the next letter is ta. So start off with if you're going to do a job and go up. Same as the sad. And then it's like a other there, and then you just make that sharper there. Press the top. You just have some water. So. Okay. The next letter uh, is a quite a strange letter. It's called Ain. Now I'm going to show it to you first, and I'm going to show you how it's done. That's the aim. It's the ah, ah, bottle stop is the, the linguistic, uh, version of, you know, what it is. So the way you do that, start off as you can do it as if you're going to do a dot, but you go slightly curved and you get to that bit. Like the ha, do that. And then this is the bit where you, just use the point of your pen to make it into that. Okay. So, um, if it's going too fast, please, or if you want to repeat, please do um, say so in the chat. The next letter I'm going to show you is the, the F or the FA. Now, this contains one of the classics of Arabic calligraphy. It's called the I. That's the I. Well, not I as in letter, but more I as in the thing that's seen through. Now, this features in three letters altogether. The first letter is the fa, or the F. 
it's, it's like a I with a bar and a dot on top. That's a bar. So that, that will sit on the line. And after that, you, you have what's called a calf, cat. I was like, well, with Q, A, or a K sounding letter. Same, we do the I. But so going across, we go down like, it's got two dots. So there we have the calf, uh, and the calf. The third letter that uses that is, is the called a wow. So feel free to say wow once it's done. Make the I again. I'm using India ink here because and I, it's watered down to make it relatively smooth. But you can use anything. So at home, um, if you're going to work with with inks, uh, you can buy calligraphy inks that are beautiful from uh, Windsor Newton uh, or Dale Rowney. Uh, you can also use drawing ink, uh, calligraphy ink from different, you know. And what's if you have no ink at home, what I, what I recommend is um, just get, you know, steep some tea in, uh, you know, for a little, for about 10 minutes and add a few drops of uh, food coloring. And that will, that will also, um, you know, suffice to actually get the form. So the wow letter, we have the I, but it, it's like the, the calf, but it's shorter. So while in, in English it will be, it will d d denote um, um, O or W, depending on where it is in the letter. So, uh, yeah, so that's the wow. So it's an O or W. So if you need an O, that will be in the middle. But if you need at the, yeah, a W at the beginning, that will be the letter you use to actually denote, denote W. Okay, next I'm going to show you the L letter. I've got quite a few letters going on here. But L is called lamb, L. So you do like the alif. You still bang down with the top. You hold the angle. It's annoying. And you, after the alif, you just do that. Join up. And that's an L. So the L will classically join onto the letter after it. So if it's like that, that will join onto the letter. The yeah, alif won't. So if you've got alif at the beginning, um, or the, yeah, the middle, it's always like that. If, if it's joining on the middle, then the alif will be like that. But nothing ever joins onto the alif after. The alif stands alone and the L always joins okay so let's see what other letters we have m m very very common in in arabic it's called mean so m you start off as if you're going to do a dot but you go up and then it's mine. so it's like an eye kind of like the eye from the wow or the fa or the ka but then it's, it's quite short, and then so one thing I'll point out is when you hold all the panels at the angle, you get these. It's like crossover points where it's as if the letter folds in itself, and that's one of the beauties because when the when these scripts were developed, um, Islamic art, calligraphy as well as geometry and arabesque and other forms were supposed to um, hint at what the eyes cannot see but the heart knows about you know, the, the, the heavenly realms. So it gives a hint at that things are hidden, but there's a beauty or a space behind. And that's where the, the these, this crossover point comes in. You can see it there, for example, or even there, kind of not so much, but it's still there. <laughs> and that that's the point of holding 
the pen always at that angle. What other letters do we have? N. So let's do an N. So N classically, it's called noon in Arabic. It's like that. It's very similar to the Saad. It's very similar to the Steen. It's the same form, but it's with a dot there. And so if, it, if that's N standalone, or if it's joined on with to letter before, you have that. But if a letter, if the N is the, the first letter of a word, you just show the dot. Same as if the B, the ba, is the first letter of the word, you just show the dot. Okay, that's an N, that's B. Okay, and we have um, two more letters. I'd like to show you. Um, one is uh, we, we we have this one that the ha, which we've seen already. That's like a h, but we've got a shorter ha, which um, it's like if a name's got like Rebecca, Rebecca, uh, that, that that kind of h. You wouldn't have this h. You'd have a shorter h, or you know. Nimra, for example, a Muslim name. Um, Sara, for example. And that letter is written like that. So it's dot and a half and comes around shorter. If you got A H at the end of your name, that'll be the letter that's that's at the end of your name. So um, these, this is the whole alphabet. And the only reason I'm good at this. It's because I've been doing it almost every day for over 20 years. So if I wasn't good by now, I always tell people I'd be in the wrong job. But it is a matter of practice. I also realize that when, you know, if I can do it, anybody can do it. And I've seen some amazing work from students of mine from the past who've done work for, for embassies as well, who've done work for, for mosques and, you know, sold art prints and, yeah, you know, so it is a matter of practice, but yeah, make sure you love it. And if you don't love it, find something else you love. Okay, um, so this is a demonstration. Um, Paul or um, uh, Brendan, is there any, any any names you can think of? So do yours, Paul. Now, uh, Paul, I don't know if you've spoken to many Arabs, but Arabs don't use use the word P. So your name would be Paul. Paul in Arabic. Uh, that's how they pronounce it. But they, but in Persian, we do have the letter P. It's like the B, but with, instead of one dot, there's three dots. So I actually sent this to Paul Smith, one of my favorite artists in the UK. I mean, I have lots of his products and uh, I'm a big fan. So I sent him a calligraphy of his name. So the first letter would be P. Now, the way you do P, if it was, a, like I showed here, that's a B, that's an N. We're, we're, going to do, we're going to do a B, but add two more dots, and that turns it into a P. And this is where the O or the wow comes in. So we've got, we'll do an I. We've got poor. Now, the wow or the O never joins onto the letter after it. You always have a, a space. So we're going to do the L afterwards. So we have. So there's your name, Paul. Yeah. So it's great. Now, I've shown you with these pens. What I'd like to do is show you with my favorite pens. Now, I have, you know, the whole collection of these many times over. They're called automatic pens. They're made in the UK since over 300 years, handmade. Um, they carry the ink, and that's where a lot of my work, you see, that um, the colours come um, pretty through. Samid? Yes. Um, somebody requested their name to be written, yeah. Jürgen, if you could Jürgen. Before yeah, you of course. Them. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll do Jürgen. Let me get another piece of paper. Okay, so Jürgen uh, is pronounced Jürgen, even though it's got a J, because I, I'm assuming it's German or North European. 
so the J is is uh, uh, you know uh, comes out as a, a a yet a Y, you could say. So I'm going to show you with my pens, the pens that I use, and how I've changed calligraphy. So, um, so actually, actually, I'll show you first using a classical pen. So we have the uh, one letter I didn't show you was the Y, is two dots. So we got your. Get a bit messy. Your and now the the the, the, the g, 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 g sound will be the A. The A has a dot, which distinguishes it from the the A. Uh, the the gain has a dot, which gives the G sound rather than the Y sound. So your G. Okay. Now what I'll do is I'll show you using my favorite pens. So we have, let's see, so we have Oops, a daisy. Sorry, it's a bit of ink, but You're a bit messed up, but you get the, the idea here. So these pens, when I use different colored inks, the inks will mix within within the inside of the pen. Thank you, Jürgen. You're very welcome. Um, so it, it, it will mix within the ink, and that, that allows me to play, explore with with uh, to, you know things to to get like here the different colors streaming through, or even the darker one that says God. That has red ink, black ink, and gold, for example. Not that one, okay. But even here, you can see the very faint lines, but if you, you know, the colors all mixing. So, this, you know, they're called automatic pens. If, if, if you want to explore or play with them, I highly recommend them. They do get messy sometimes, which is half the fun, I think, of being an artist. And uh, you come in all different shapes and sizes. That's the 6A, which is the large one. You get Thinner ones, uh, I've got them here. Oh, I had them here. Okay, there we are. So you get them very thin as well. And everything in between the different forms and nibs. Okay, so uh, any questions so far, or anybody wondering, you know, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. No. As, uh, Samir, it's just so beautiful and meditative watching. Yeah. Uh, watching this Thank you. incredible um i wonder if you've got time for some questions from me and then maybe yeah, please. Um, we can yeah. hear, hear from the audience yeah um, let me turn the camera around to let's see what's it looking uh, okay uh there we are okay I'm back good so we, yeah, sorry, um, yes sir Hello to everybody as well, I should say, and thank you for the introduction from Brendan at the start and what a wonderful session uh, this is and has been. In, it's so dexterous, beautiful. Um, Islamic calligraphy, Samir, is known as KAT, uh, K-H-A-T-T, -T, which is yes. derived from the words for line, design or construction. True. And... It, it strikes me that we can draw upon modernist language of form and function to describe the unity of an image when we're talking about, um, uh, you know, modernist, um, early modernist works. And then we might go forward to abstract expressionism in the 1950s. Um, the sophisticated language of modernist criticism talks about uh, form and function. And yes. I wonder if you can talk about how form and function come together within your images. Great question. Um, okay, <clears throat> so I, I've deviated totally from from the classical forms of calligraphy in that it, uh, it's it's more technical drawing when it's done. Um, you can see that in, when you go to mosques, all the everything's the same size and same direction. Mm -hmm. Mine deviates because I, I when I was living in Germany working as a doctor, I 
I, I, uh, I, I spent a week with a Japanese artist and it totally fascinated me because the point was to feel what you're going to do rather than know the technique. It's, it's important to know the technique. Yes. But once you know the technique, you throw the rules away and you let who you, you are come through in your art. And I, I try to carry that through to my, my, when I was studying and practicing my Arabic calligraphy. And that's why in my first exhibition, I was in, informed that it's very beautiful, but it's all wrong, which, mm. you know, which is a great thing. And now, yeah, my style is accepted as a, as a, a formal style of contemporary Islamic calligraphy, because even though it's all wrong, it still has rules that are inherent in it. So the form and the, function is that is uh which you which you asked about it's um the way it comes through for me and i made this experience many times over the last two decades mm. i will contemplate a word or a phrase or an idea or a concept for example soul so yeah. in arabic the word for soul is ruh spirit so i did a piece and i gave it away for a charity uh for the big issue foundation at, at uh, the Affordable Arts Fair and had it hanging there. And a gentleman came and stood in front of it and didn't move for an hour. And so I said to him, I'm the artist, if you have any questions, he goes, thank you. After an hour, he, he said, I'm going to come back. I'm going for a coffee. Came back and then stood in front of it, of, of it again for about half an hour. Mm. And then he said, ask me, what does that say? And I said to him, you tell me what it says, because you spent more time with it than I have for the last <laughs> you know, few hours. And he, sa he said, does it say soul? And I said, yes, that's exactly what it says in Arabic. And I asked him, do you read Arabic? He said, no. But he wow. said, I can read that in the art. Mm. And I, I, I was so moved. I, you know, it's just one of my favorite experiences of, of being an artist. Yeah. Was that. And uh, so he bought it straight away, which is great. It, we, we love those as artists as well. Um, but it's, uh, it's when you instill something, when you have the intention, not everybody will see it, but people are open to see, experience the art, mm. will get something coming through of the function. Now, the great thing about art, in my opinion, is that actually, ultimately, it serves no function. And that mm. gives it a very wide space to actually perform many different functions according to the person who experiences it, the person who created it, the setting it is in, the context yeah. of where they experience it. So it's like a, it's more archetypal, you could say. There's like an inherent somethingness of humanity in the artwork that every human being would recognize. Yeah. And so through that experience, I've done exhibitions in, in churches, in synagogues, I've held workshops where I've you know, taught um, young Jewish children in synagogue Arabic calligraphy, and they've, they've taught me you know, mm. Hebrew. And it's it's like this. It's so beautiful because we can recognize yeah. the forms, yeah. even though even if you can't, like Brendan said in the beginning, you can't read it, but something inside you can read it. Yeah. Same with your both your work and lots of work that I love. I can read it. It touches me. I don't know. I don't always understand why. Yeah. But it does touch me, and I, I, I allow myself space to experience that. And maybe someday I'll understand, maybe someday I won't. But that's like life, really. Life's full of those little things that you don't understand, <laughs> and it's fine, you know? Does that answer your question? It certainly does. There's a, yeah, there's obviously a universality to, to, to the work, and um, you're very much your unique voice, you know, within calligraphy comes through. We've got a question in the chat yeah. from Hajra, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And Hajra says, I'm wondering if you've ever experienced, if you've ever experimented with calligraphic styles from other cultures, such as yeah. Chinese or Japanese, and if so, how have you found them? Um, yes, I have. I have. Uh, I was invited to do an exhibition that uh, a church in Cambridge by the, the Professor of Divinity, Dave, Dr. David Ford, mm. to do five scrolls of prayers in the original language of uh, Chinese, Japanese, Spanish, German, and you know, uh, English, and also 
to combine Arabic within them. So I played and explored for a couple of months with different things, doing it really badly, but allowing myself to to really kind of feel into it rather than do it from from the head. I I I went to a few masters or you know celebrated artists who practice these scripts to just learn from from their being as well, and I. It's the same as doing Arabic, in my opinion. It's yeah. um, I, I'm good at Arabic because I've been doing it. I did badly for five years, and for the last seventeen years, I've been doing it well. But you know, so to become good at Japanese, Chinese, or other scripts, the German, the Gothic script. Yeah, you know, I lived in in Munich for almost ten years. So I just saw it everywhere. I love it. Mm. You know, and a lot of my influence come from that as well, with the way the lines are connected and form, like you know pictures almost um yeah. and uh so I, I i love exploring different things you know in hebrew i just uh i went to a grand opening for a, a mural i did in a school last year that was a year's project and we did be, the children chose be kind so i wrote be kind in uh, sanskrit hebrew arabic english and uh, chinese yeah. scripts and it's all up there, and yeah, I'm happy to send photos. If you go to my Facebook, it's there, you know. And uh, it's it's all the same, in my opinion. Mm. And I just have more practice with the Arabic, but it's uh, I find it equally exciting and to explore that. That the, the, the Chinese is great because it's, they're all pictograms. Yes, every okay. it's all paint. It's like painting a picture that you've got to re learn to read the picture, mm. and I, I think. Other scripts are, are similar in that if you experience them in the right context and the right you know, frame mm. of mind. Yeah. That's, a, that's a wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. Obviously, your, your, your paintings are extremely painterly. Um, yes. There are subtleties in terms of the color tone and form and gesture. And, you know, it's a shame today, obviously, that we're looking at a, a screen, but that's the nature of, of today's yeah. session. Yeah. I'm just wondering, with all of that in mind, how and where do you want them to be seen? How, how, sh how what would be the, 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 the best context, if you like, for the work? <clears throat> I, I used to do exhibitions and I got tired of it, to be honest. Mm. I find me, I mean, maybe I'm, you know, I shouldn't say this, but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> I found lots of the art scene very pretentious and very, very self important. Yes, spot on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I just, I, I, I did not want to play that game anymore. So I stopped doing exhibitions. And so what I do now, I do lots of these, at least 15 to 20 every year. Mm. I, I'll, I'll go to events or parties or things. I've done work for the Saudi, you know, royal family and the, the, the ambassador from Bahrain, the ambassador from the Emirates or, you know, um, I was at the Metropolitan Police, the New Scotland Yard last week. Mm where I'll, I'll take along my inks and my, my, my lovely automatic pens and I'll write people's names. Yeah. And then they'll go away with them. And I've done this tens of thousands of times over the last 15 years. I love it because yeah. it's th that way my art goes into people's homes. And one of my favorite experiences when I do these events, people come up to me and say, oh my God, you did my son's name when he was like, yay high. And he, we have it in the front room. It's still there. And now he's going to university or he's traveling around the world or he's getting married. And would mm. you please do his name again, you know, to compliment that? Mm. And I'm like, well, when was this? And they're like, at least 14 years ago. And I'm like, wow. So for me, that that's an absolute honor and privilege that pe I create beautiful things that people want to have in their homes that become part of their lives. Yeah. And so that's the main thing, you know, that I love. That's what I want my, my art to be in people's lives. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I, I work on commissions and I work on this. Well, like the mural I did, I, uh, uh, I opened the Woods of Red Opening yesterday. It's 12 meters high and four meters wide. Mm. So it's a whole year project and scaffolding involved and lots of amazing. learning about how do we create amazing color that's crazy on a wall that will still be there in 20 years. You know, how do we prepare the walls? How do we, and it was fabulous, you know. So yeah. that, yeah, and uh, at least 2,000 people walk past that wall every day because yeah. it's in part of a park that where three schools are, where all the kids come. And, you know, I, I think 
yeah, that, that's an example of where I want my art to be, where people can look at it, not always understand it, but just think it's beautiful and go, that's what, Brendan, when you said when my work's beautiful, I got really touched, thank you. <laughs> You know, that's like it wow. It's like yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I don't take it for granted, but you know, it's uh, one, yeah. one of the things that strikes me. I mean, you've spent a lot of time talking about the architecture of the forms themselves, the Arabic. Yes. Um, script, the the characters of the um, uh, uh, of the um, alphabet, but actually, when it comes to your paintings. Um, it is all about layering and the opacity of the pigments, the transparency of the pigments, yes. and building them. And that's 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 the stuff of what I see as painting, my own abstract yeah. painting practice. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And, and that's why I think what Paul was pressing on was this idea about where do you see them? You're absolutely right about the, the art world, I'm afraid to say, and apologise for it. But... I mean, I would love to. I've seen your your paintings only on screen so far, and I would love to see them in the flesh, um, yeah. on paper um, or on canvas or however. You know, I assume they're on they're yeah. on paper. Uh, I'd love to see how the ink sits on that paper. Yeah. I'd love to see the richness of the colours, the textures, oh. the tones, and mm -hmm. because that's what gives life to painting. That, yeah, because there's something physical and material about it when you see it in the flesh. It's a difference from seeing a picture of a painting um, on screen or in a book and then being face to face with it in a gallery or a museum. Mm. Um, and and mm. I, I guess that's where I think Paul was going at with that question was just trying to find out how, how, how would you wish us to experience these paintings? Because I'd love to see them in the flesh. I'd love to do it. After you've just said that, I, I, I'm thinking, I'm planning in my head which exhibitions to sure. organize. What, what, one of the most beautiful compliments I ever got was um, <clears throat> from a German lady who's, um, who's um, this must be about 20 years ago or something. I, I showed some work at some event and she says, she asked me, do you realize that you create ley lines with ink? Mm. Now, ley lines are the grid that crosses over the world that's measured, that like where the energy fluctuates, where you know, like all churches are built where ley lines cross because it's a place where the energy is very high. You can experience things that you wouldn't experience normally in everyday life. Mm. So she, when she said that, I understood it as, well, you experience the world in a different way when you stand in front of my art and you're allowed to touch. I always encourage people to touch my art. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm like, okay, if it gets messed up, I'll just do it again. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not attached to, the art itself, I'm just attached to the pursuit of expressing myself, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I am a bit precious about some pieces. I would, <laughs> anyway, but, uh, but most of the stuff is like, it's fine. It's, it's okay. I, I, I trust the process. Yeah. I, I keep thinking, Samir, about early conversations that, that we had. And uh, both Brendan and myself talked about our early experiences as students at art school. And, uh, you know, Brendan um, talked about, you know, his relationship to Islamic art. And I talked about my relationship to Islamic art, which was actually through through seeing textiles and we yeah. Persian textiles. And, um, of course, there isn't that translation. One can't translate, if you like, but what one... Sees, and this is a thing as I kept uh, I kept thinking about as you were talking, which was about this kind of personalizing, this connection that we have to the to the work, and I think that has to do with the beauty of the form and the structure within, and so there's something around that um, sort of um, inner kind of connection that we might have with the with the work which i think is very present it, it, mm. even in the demonstration today and uh, yeah you, you said something really lovely at one point i wrote it down here um you said uh, something about what well, the eye can't see but the heart knows and i really yeah. like that. Um, I have to say, I've got, I've got my pencils here i strapped two pencils together <laughs> <It's> <laughs> okay. away so i have my i've been following <laughs> this um properly um but yeah, I absolutely. I, I love that because um, I think art is, we tend to think about art as something as just having an emotional connection. I think it's about ideas first more than anything else. Oh, it's about yeah. ideas and it's about 
what moves the heart it's both yeah. things. it's the head and the heart that's what it comes together um when i hear people talk about art saying it's just expressive i think you're missing something really important mm. it's a fundamentally it's um an aesthetic and a philosophical discipline and, yeah. and it brings yeah. ideas philosophical ideas and it brings the way we feel about the world around us together yes uh, in some kind sure. of unity um and i think what this does is is the way it talks about calligraphy deals with text and text is the words that give voice um yeah, yeah. Uh, but actually it's about unpicking those those words um yeah. that vocabulary and giving it something else giving it a little yeah. bit of mm. that renewed meaning and i think that's what makes these works so interesting and your own it's it, the color the color is so seductive it's enriching it's got depth that brings new life um, as well as the, as well as the formal arrangement. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, have a, I mean, no. I've always been fascinated by colours, and it's just the way they interact, the way they express something, the way they we relate to them. So, and so people ask me, why do you choose those colours? I'm like, I don't. <laughs> the <laughs> colours choose themselves. I, it's like when I'm really like when I'm doing names, like you know, some events I'll do a thousand names over the weekend. Mm. and people are like how do you do that i was like i don't i i have the skill set i have the tools but i'm just a witness and allow the that work to come through me rather than me create that work as well which is you know which comes through practice and like i said doing it badly for five years allowed you to do it well eventually you know, anything you do badly for five years turns out well yeah Absolutely. Yeah, so you're going to be about to ask something, Paul. I was, yes. I've just got, I've, I've just got a final question, unless we've got any more questions coming from the audience. Um, and it's a, it's an interesting one, I, th I hope, around the sort of technical aspects of uh, of calligraphy. So I understand that historically there are two cursive scripts in common use yeah. within Islamic calligraphy, and that is the Kuthik. I'm going, uh, yeah, I pronounced that correctly, and the Nask. Yeah. And yeah. can you tell us a little bit about about those? Okay, well, it's it's when Islam came about, they wanted to write the the Quran down. Mm. They had to choose a script, and you know there was calligraphers. It's it, 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 I think it, it comes a lot from not Aramaic. The word's gone right out of my head. One of the old scripts. Yeah, they, 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 they've been trained that, so they they translated it to the Arabic script, and so it's actually Kufar was the place where it all started apparently yeah and so they did that's develop a script that was easy to read that was beautiful that was you know easy to write as well so that yeah as islam spread to china and beyond um they could carry the book to say this is what islam said yeah and so it became like a standardized form of um of you know writing and to make it legible rather than a scribbly kind of you know Mm -hmm. like and and then as that developed as as they started building mosques and you know a mosque isn't a place only of worship it's a place of community a place where you go to find your who you are in the grand scheme of things amongst the people you live with and with mm -hmm. the universe that's beyond and so they needed a, they needed a, uh, a script that was beautiful that could decorate the mosque and that's came wow. about and so that, that was in the beginning, you know, a couple of hundred years, few hundred years, and other scripts developed from there. Yeah. So you mentioned cursive, but now, if you look at it now, there's like the, the Maghribi scripts, the, like the, the, uh, the, uh, ones from North Africa are just so beautiful. Mm. It's just like, so like human and swirly and curly and, you know, just like playful. And, you know, they just bring me joy when I read them or look at them. Those other scripts as well, people are developing different scripts. Like my script I've developed, you know, the last 20 years. It's a very, very fresh one. But there's yeah. some amazing scripts out there. And so Nusk was there as a standard. And it's yeah. still used in a lot of the Quran. You know, once they, once all the, you know, the if you look at the Kufic, the early Kufic, it was still a bit rough compared to what we see now. But yeah. it, at the time, it was like, you know, mind-breakingly clear and, you know, precise. Yeah. Kufic itself developed into um, square Kufic, which you see in lots of mosques and lots of decorations and logos. I yeah. work with it a lot of the time. Square Kufic is pure technical drawing. It's yeah. just like you start with square paper and you join the dots and try and make the words all fit into a square and 
yeah. you know, it's, it's fabulous. It's like a mental exercise. How do I express this phrase or word in this form? Yeah. Yeah. So it's really exciting, but, but, um, my, my usual work is a bit more free and expressive and a bit more crazy. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Those changes across geographic boundaries, like you said, you know, sort of thinking yeah. of North Africa and, Significance there. Thank you. So China as well. Yeah. yeah, China. There's amazing stuff going on. Sorry, I just interrupted you. Yeah. No, that's all right. I was. Just, I was sorry. I, I certainly don't want to stop your flow. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, all of this. I just. I just wanted to thank you, really, Samir, for today. Yeah. It's been um, an absolutely amazing workshop, and I'm. I'm sure that the audience has been appreciative of of these techniques being revealed. I feel like we've. You know. Peered behind the curtain. Fantastic. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, I, think we do, I think we do have another question, Samia, um, but yeah, I think, yeah. uh, somebody's going to ask it uh, directly. Yes. Is this thank you. you thank you so much, Brandon. Yes, Samir, you mentioned you had some medical experience, uh, yes. in fact, many years of it. And um, because life has taken you, taken you down that path, I wondered if, um, if, if maybe you're conscious of it or you, you can see how that informed your art totally your totally yeah. absolutely what i loved about medicine was that you get to meet human beings you know at their core level what tired me at the end was you only get to meet them when they're sick and complaining <laughs> so uh, <laughs> but i love that and it really gave me a compassion and like a slight understanding of what it means to be human what what do human beings want what do they strive for what do they look for and that I try to express in my art as well, so human beings can recognize it. But also, healing is about making whole. And, you know, art is one of those things as well. It's like a, seeing a child smile at you, seeing an experienced piece of art, eating really great food. It makes you whole in the moment. You're, the world is, everything in the world is okay. Your mind is still and your heart is open. And that, that's, 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 that, 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 you know, that's what we try and do with medicine, and that's what I try and do with my art as well. Just yeah. to, you know, like that, make us whole again, make me whole again. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way. I've still got lots of lots more adventures, but you know, it's been great so far. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you so much. Yes, because I was thinking to myself that wow, what you were talking about the rules in calligraphy, are like a little bit like the tough medical world and yeah. you know you, you um very often you're not um, there's no space for being an artist within yeah. the medical community and when you are True. suppressed for so long the moment you open yeah. up it yeah. just flourishes once you yeah, get all color, that like, yeah, yeah. After, yeah. Yeah. yeah all that's been waiting bottled up for so long just comes out but like lots of alternative medicine you know is, is like that as well where oh, yeah, the healing there's lots arts, of access yeah. to, totally the access to to that you know i used to work a lot with colors and form and in my in my and poetry when i worked in medicine you mm. know sometimes i prescribe a poem rather than a some some medicine and it worked <laughs> and it was just, it's fabulous you know not yeah, always not, and sometimes because, because art really is a salve for the soul isn't it I mean, that's yeah, exactly totally. what it is um, when it's authentic when it's real yeah when it's like you know that's why when i teach i say Technique is important, but what's more important is how do I get what's in here, out there, in my yeah. art, express it in a way. And it's, you don't have to do it, but you have to, I think, great art, you experience it because something from inside is there. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter if it's the theatre performance or dance or calligraphy or anything, film. There's loads of amazing short movies that are coming out where I think, wow. You know, a, a ten-minute movie can make me cry and weep because it's it captures something. You know, well, sometimes it, uh, an awful lot of people think art is um, therapeutic or cathartic, and it makes the artist um, feel better, feel good about themselves. Um, and you said about your own practice. You said after a day in the studio, I feel really, really relaxed. And I was feeling yeah. terribly jealous uh, of you because I often go into the studio myself. And some days th things go well and I come out feeling pretty good. Some days, quite a lot of them, I come out thinking everything's gone wrong, so many accidents, so many mistakes, and I feel like I've wasted the entire day and I feel frustrated. 
And I always tell same my here, students, same here, but I feel great that's about good, it. That's good to <laughs> what I tell my students is that frustration is really important. It drives yeah. you to do something. Mm. Totally, and when I was totally. Watching, and when I was watching you um, sh in that workshop demonstration, and you say, oh, I'm a middle little drip here or a spill here. But those paintings that are, are on your website, which are absolutely stunning, there's not a mistake anywhere. Now, when I'm painting uh, as an abstract painter, I always uh, I borrow a, another artist phrase. I manage accidents sometimes. I try and you know, yeah. make a mistake, I, I experiment, and then I try and gloss over it and, and make the best of it. But yours don't seem to do that. You seem to have a technical precision which gets it right. Mm. And I, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that, because they, they are so right. precise, those paintings. Fabulous question. Um, well, I'm going to answer another question that you haven't asked before I get to that one. <laughs> okay. If I get stuck at, in my studio with what I'm doing, I'll try and make a mistake that I've never made before. Mm. Because I... The point is to to meet the paper. And it doesn't matter if you spend all day doing rubbish doodles that you're going to throw in the bin or burn, but the, that experience is will bring you to the next point. The thing is to keep moving. And so I, there, there are times when I think, oh, God, that was rubbish. I can't believe it. But I hope, no, I hope nobody sees how bad that was. I'll throw it away before someone does. But I, I, I'm complete with, I spent my day or my couple of hours meeting the paper or meeting, you know, the, do you understand? Mm -hmm. Or while I work in Photoshop, I have, I don't know if you ever worked in Photoshop, but you have final version one, final version two, final version three, up to vi final version 85, because they're all final version, but they're all the, but it's the same with my art. So when I do calligraphy, I did a commission recently and it was to do a phrase from the Quran. And I did it 20 times. But my inspiration from that, Henri Cartier-Besson, one of the most famous photographers, street photographers, I love his work. Mm -hmm. If you look at his, his um, uh, the negative sheet, he'll have 32 photos and he'll pick one. And that one will become world famous. But he's got 32 others that he doesn't show anybody. Mm -hmm. And that, that's part of being an artist is the process. And... You know, and lots of times things will be, you know, technically brilliant, but not authentic from here. And sometimes they'll be totally authentic, but technically, you know, not very good at all. And I'd rather, you know, so I kind of exploring to find where it's both a lot of the time. Mm. With names, it's easy. Cause, you know, when you've done something again and again and again, you don't, if I think about it, I can't do it. But if I just let it come through me. So, I, like I said, I did a thousand names of people on, you know, a4 or A3 sheets with ink at an event recently. Cassia Bresson was famous, of course, for not cropping his photographs. And, yeah. and you, what you see is what he saw through his viewfinder. It's and fabulous. It's a wonderfully yeah. direct relationship between his eye and his mind and yeah. the image that you're left with. Um, my, my, my cameras are... Uh, photographs to achieve that is no surprise. And, um, yeah, yeah, fascinating. Totally. That's like what he experienced, what he... Mm. Absolutely. Captured. That's why the main camera I use is an old Fuji X100. But it's like it's like a rangefinder. I always use the optical viewfinder to 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 play, explore, and capture that rather than looking at the screen. Mm. I switch the screen off, and then afterwards I look at it. Go, oh wow! Oh no! <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's great. <coughs> Excuse me. So that directness is kind of interesting. That you're finding that correspondence with that directness of Cartier Bresson and your own kind of directness. And, um, yeah, because yeah, there, there appears to be no mistakes in in the um, oh, the execution. Lots, but but, it, but I've learned to trust the mistakes. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like when I do names, for example, or do a piece, and it'll come out wrong. I know that that's not the final piece, so I put the paper aside and do it again, and then it'll come out even better than I envisioned it. So it's mm. like it's like something in me is making the mistake to bring a more authentic part or yeah. a piece of art out of myself. And if I think about it too much, I'll get frustrated, upset, angry, can't think, and then I can't do any art. Yeah. Like, I'm like, oh my God, that's such a great mistake. Look how terrible that is. You know? And I have that. There's an old Sufi technique called joy at sudden disappointment. So every time you get disappointed or something wrong happens, rather than doing what we typically do with close our hearts, you're supposed to open your heart. 
I wouldn't recommend it because God will just, yeah, in my opinion, God or whatever, you know, create the universe will keep sending you disappointment because he wants you to be happy. <laughs> but, um, it's like, uh, I, I learned through that, but you know, it was real hard at the beginning, but now I'm just like, Oh wow, that's terrible. Okay. <laughs> Not take it personally. Mm. But, yeah. Just make, and same with training. Thank you to all the participants. I'm sorry. I haven't had a chance to interact with you more, but, when you practice this, if you like it, just go easy on yourself and be happy to make the mistakes and be happy to do it badly and to explore it and see, you know, something in you will express itself in the art. And we need more artists. We need, you know, the, the world's hungry for good artists. There's space for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Very, very true. Right. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm, I'm con I, was, I was hoping we'd have um, some more questions from the audience. You've very, um, you either been very, very patient, or um, yeah. you, you you feel Samir has has answered a great deal already. But uh, um, I'll, I'll just give it another minute or two to see if there are any further questions um, or any uh, names. If you want me to do names, send them through, and I'll do them. Yeah, mm. you because know, we've got ten more minutes, and then we have yeah. ten more minutes. Does anybody have a name? They I was absolutely thrilled and um, honoured to have my name Fatima, okay. written down. Fatima, Fatima just said, "I'm going to yeah. use the thinner, thinner pen." And we've also this. we've also got Cynthia as well. That's Sim. Sims. Yeah. Sims is that S I M S? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You've got three uh, now. Ida as well. That's right. Brilliant. Okay. So Fatima, I saw first, and Sims and Ida. So Fatima, I'm going to do yours. So I'll, I'm going to do it out of order in the way I do it, okay? So we've got and the, Fatima, you get the good pens. <laughs> yeah. They're so lovely to work with. It's just like... Yeah. It is absolutely, as, as, as Paul was saying earlier, just watching the kind of dexterousness of the mark making is really wonderful. Mm. Thank you. This comes from doing it so many times and... Yeah, but I love it. You can tell it as well. Mm. So no, I the passion well. absolutely comes through. Sami, once you finish that, and if we have, still have a couple of minutes, if you could yeah. choose one of your paintings and just take us through, you know, just to sure. talk about it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so Sims, and then what was the last name? We've got an, one more. Uh, Fatima Cynthia. C oh, Cynthia. 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 That's it. Yeah. Okay. And Ida. Ida, that's it. So I'll do Cynthia now. Oops. There we go. <laughs> Whoops. So Sin. B. Yeah. And then that's Cynthia, that's Fatima, and Ida. So Ida, let's see. Samir, I wonder if you could later take photographs of the names of different people. Send yeah. the Mac first and then we can arrange for them to have it sent by email if people... <coughs> so what I'll do then afterwards, I'll do them the same, but do them on separate sheets, and scan them and send them through. I'll be happy to do that, yeah. Mm. We have another Absolutely. name as well, uh, Shireen as well, please, Sammy. Okay. So that's Ida and then Shireen. I'll, I'll do it like this, and then I'll, what I'll do, I'll do them all separately afterwards. And yeah. send them through. So let's see... So, uh, Shireen. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. That's really lovely. Good. Uh, I'll do all those again and through afternoon okay so you want to 
we talk about one of our paintings. Um, yeah, yes, choose one of your paintings and just take us through about the calligraphy, the painting, okay. uh, little uh, artistic journey. Uh, that's probably a good one. Um, let's see. The one we showed first. Um, let's see, hold on. <coughs> um, let me just choose one. I'm just looking to see. Don't have many there. Oh, one second. I have. Oh, I will. It's just, it's just loading. Sorry. And I'll be able to share it. Take your time. No problem. Okay. Now, this one. That says God. Now, um, it says God in a way that was never done before I did it. <laughs> and when I did it, people complained and said, we can't write God like that. And nobody writes God like that. I said, exactly, that's why I'm writing like that. I used these pens so you can see the way all the colors just stream through. I used gouache, for those who are wondering. Gouache is a, it's a kind of, well, not, not really, but kind of a watercolor that, um, a bit more powdery and so the colors rather than mixing together they'll stream into each other and around each other you can see that that says god allah that says al malik which is my name my surname but also you know one of the names of god so it means the king or the master of the universe it's a fabulous name for god master of the universe <laughs> yeah <laughs> bring it back to my childhood um but these are when i was exploring and i i i uh I got hold of some scrap paper in the charity shop from a printing press, which was very glossy and, you know, held ink, but, you know, it was very, very tough. And I sat in the garden. And I just wanted to, I wondered, what is this paper all about? What, how does it work? And um, so I started exploring with gouache and with Ben and this and that. And this form just came out. And for me, that was... You know, it has mistakes, you could say, because the lines faded there and they, there was a little smudge there and that bit's missing there. But for me, that was a perfect expression of where I was at the time in my search for who is God in yeah, the grand scheme of things and small scheme of things. It's like a journey. It's reaching up, but there's like, it all curves in itself and it's, it's behind and in front. And for me, that was just like, wow that really spoke to me. It's like, yeah, that, that's what I'm trying to show, even though I didn't know that that was what I was trying to show. And that was, for me, so beautiful. So that developed into that. Now, what I did here was um, I used, um, what's that? There's a special black paint that's, like, very, very black. I can't remember what it's called now. Uh, it starts with V. But then I, what, here... I imagine that earlier piece was like every, everybody's trying to do that earlier piece. We're always, all trying to reach God. So mm -hmm. I went a bit Jackson Pollock and I got the three primary colors and I mixed them in palettes to get all the different colors. And I, I just made a massive mess in the, in the garden and splashed them, you know, all over my clothes and all over everything and the shed. But to, that's a meter by a meter. And for me, that represented all the prayers and all the seeking and all everything that the, everybody has, all going towards this space that actually nobody can see with their eyes, but we all feel everything mm. with our with our hearts. And that as Muslims, we bow down to it at least five times a you know a, a, a day. And so for me, that was that whole experience. And when I I actually exhibit, did exhibit that one a couple of years ago at an exhibition and I invited everyone to touch it because it's all, it's like, it's got, it's textured completely because it's like, I don't know, almost 40 layers of paint on there. And you can see the bits where, you know, there's the, too much of this, too much of that, but it's not really. And when I finished that, I just cried. I just thought, oh, that's it. That's why you know, I'm there, but that's, I belong to all of this. And we're all going towards that. Well, my heart knows it's there, but it's uh, but my eyes can't see anything. It's all black, and it's like this is this is perfect for where I was at my journey then. 
Yeah, this is about four years ago I did this. <clears throat> and this is one of the few pieces I've kept. I actually gave it to my mum. So, because yeah. she loved it. I was like, okay, you know, that'll make mum happy. So <laughs> she's still got it in her kitchen. But it's it's just like, you know, most of my pieces I just give away. I've learned to give away to make space for new stuff. But that, that one really resonates with me still and just really, I yeah. love it. I can sit in front of it for hours. And you're right, Brendan. When you sit in front of the real one, you can feel the colours. It's like it's radiating off of it. Mm. Yeah. I, I just think you need to be careful that you're giving them away. <laughs> so you, know, you might have oh, an I, awful I, lot I of requests well. at the end of this oh, yeah. presentation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, it's terrific. Thank you. Thank but you there's, there's so many. Um, thank you. Was that was that good, Kestra? Oh, it was excellent. We needed something like that to end it off. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look. And look, there's that same God, but there's love. Um, and for me, it was the same yeah. thing. Yeah. So that says love, using the same pens, almost the same ink, done at the same time. So I, somebody asked me, why do you keep writing God? And I said, because I'm still trying to work out who God is for me. Same thing with love. What mm -hmm. does love mean? I think I know, but I'm also open to you know, changing my mind or deepening my experience. And so it's like a meditation. It's like a journey in itself. And mm. it's a great journey, you know, playing with colors and form and making a mess while looking for love and God. Is, you know? Yeah, probably a good title for my autobiography. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, that is the kind of journey of a lifetime, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. I Thank you, everybody. That I think that is probably a really good time to we're coming to fifteen twenty eight now. So, Samir, can I thank you so much for an absolutely enlightening and uh, riveting um, presentation and talk? Can I thank Paul, Vivian as well um, yeah. for uh, your uh, in, uh, insights as well? Absolutely fascinating, some great questions. And can I thank uh, Macfest as well, Kesra? Um, uh, Katazina, Hajra and everybody there for all your support for making today possible um, I'm going to hand over I think to Katazina just to close but yeah. thank you all and thank you all for joining us uh, from Can all I over the world uh, I noticed there was somebody from Albania even here, thank you so wow. much thank really you. really appreciate it and, and get in touch if you want me to email a sheet please to, with the alphabet yeah Thank you. Thank you so much, Samir, Brendan, Paul. It was fantastic. Thank you. Before I let you go, I would just like to mention uh, the two uh, digital events coming next weekend. On that day, we've got uh, comic books uh, with David Hirsch. And then Ooh. on Sunday, we've got calligraphy, carpet, and uh, carpet weaving and miniature painting. painting. And oh. in the meantime, we also have Sunday um, in the morning, a live event, uh, Eat Science Extravaganza at the Science and Industry Museum. And the tickets for that event um, are only available at the Science and Industry Museum. That's why it says unavailable on uh, MacFest Eventbrite. So thank you very much for today. <laughs> and I hope to see you all on our next event. Thank you, thank you very much. God bless. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you, so much. you, everybody. Uh, thank you. That was terrific, all of you. Absolutely oh. enriching event, uh, Paul, Brendan, and Sammy. Sammy, you're so lucky. <laughs> I, mean, I so am. I am. Enriching I am just like, wow. And the Thank questions are amazing. <laughs> we have got, if you like, uh, guys, uh, next Sunday, we've got Samara in the audience. Uh, Samara Mean, she's a miniature painter. And we oh. have a colleague of her, Asker, um, uh, Asker Ali from Pakistan. And a carpet person, three special, oh. a real rich feast all the way from Pakistan. Fantastic. Uh, and then Saturday we have comics, uh, 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 comic writing or comic books uh, in Arabic. Great. Wow. Okay, I'll Brilliant. be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.